Yeah. Off your cell phones and turn on your T coil if that applies to you. We're very happy to welcome today Jack Moody, Professor of International Economics at Grinnell College. He will be speaking to us on friend or foe international trade partners. Please welcome Jack Moody. Thank you. I'm uh, impressed that that many of you have come to hear a speech about economics. <laughs> That's often known as a rather dry topic. And you may have even heard that economics is known as the dismal science. I wondered where it got that label, so I went to the great source of Wikipedia to tell me. And, and it said that this traces back to the 19th century when Thomas Carlyle was objecting to his fellow Scotsman, Adam Smith, writing about a world where there wouldn't be much government intervention at all. Hands off, Adam Smith, free market story. And Thomas Carlyle thought that was a prescription for ruin within the, the world economy, because he figured if you gave everybody the chance just to work as much as they wanted to and then choose to go on vacation, they'd choose vacation. They would not work enough. And I guess he'd never heard of American workaholics at that point. But uh, our story would be that uh, Carlyle said we needed to go back to the days of slavery to make sure people actually worked enough. So that was his dismal prospect for what ought to happen in the world. Sort of at that same time, there was another dismal sort of prognostication, and that was by uh, Pastor uh, Robert Malthus. You may have heard of the Malthusian challenge of saying, what happens when we have more and more people being born into the earth will we have enough food to keep up with those people? And Malthus' view was that we would essentially end up with starvation, that that's what would keep the population in check, and we would never progress as a civilization either, because we had this check in terms of our natural ability to grow more food. So that was pretty dismal too. There, uh, it's easy to be a pessimist when you look at this economic literature. <laughs> so. Uh, we're going to talk about international trade today. That's not quite such a pessimistic topic because international trade economists, there's probably more consensus on, among the economists on that particular issue than almost any other issue, saying that we typically expect there's a benefit to international trade, that if we send soybeans to China and we bring back shirts from China, that we get shirts for a, a lower cost than we could make them ourselves, and China would get soybeans at a lower cost than if they grew it themselves. So both sides would gain. There would be mutual benefit from trading. Of course, that doesn't mean that everybody in the country necessarily gains. And within our last presidential election cycle, we certainly heard a lot about who are the people who've been left behind in that process of international trade and globalization. And we know that that also had uh, something to do with the Brexit vote of Britain choosing to leave the European Union. Well, there are so many of these uh, disputes or uh, alternative interpretations of what's going on in the economy that I'm not going to try and cover the globe today. I'm just going to deal with American trade policy because uh, President Trump has been quite active on that front. He. Uh, is pretty skeptical of almost any multilateral agreement, that he'd much rather have a bilateral agreement where you sit one-on-one -on -one and you come up with the best deal you can. And if that's the sort of world we're in, then we might think, well, what are some of the consequences that we'd end up with for the United States? So I'm going to talk about our top five trade partners today. That'll be China, Canada, Mexico, Japan and Germany. So those are the countries that account for half of our trade. So we still trade with a lot of other countries, but that's a, a healthy part of the story if we have an understanding of what's going on with those important trade partners there. 
So if I'm uh, working this right, we are looking at our number one trade partner, China. We may recognize the picture on the left as President Xi Jinping of China, that he's probably one of the few heads of state in the world today who knows where Iowa is and knows something about us as Iowans as well. So that may be a, a plus. We'll, we'll see how that evolves in the, the next four years. President Xi, though, has been much less interested in political and economic reform than his predecessor, and he's much more interested in centralizing power within the, the communist system in China. So it's uh, what people thought might unfold 10 years ago is not quite what's unfolding today. Also on the right side, you see the symbol for the Chinese currency, the renminbi or the yuan. We may wonder, well, why are there two names for a currency? Is that sort of confusing? And uh, it would be like talking about British pound sterling. So sometimes we say sterling is the general generic term for all British currency, and then the pound is something that tells us the units of that currency. So the yuan would be the units of the renminbi. So we've got uh, the Chinese currency that obviously is a, an important fact uh, that we would consider in the world economy today. In terms of China being too big to ignore, China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001. And when they were negotiating to join, that was definitely a long, arduous process. It took more than 12 years. How are you going to take a communist-oriented system and meld it with a system that essentially was based on market rules and discipline as to how trade ought to occur. We can imagine that there was a lot of careful scrutiny by the United States, by the European Union. Those would have been two major critics. But in fact, the very last country, to, if you're going to join the WTO, you need to get unanimous consent of everybody who's already in the WTO. Sort of like joining the country club and everybody has to vote to let you into the country club. Well, this is the same sort of deal on the WTO. that You have to convince all these other countries who've already agreed to cut tariffs among themselves. So if you're going to get the benefit of all those concessions, then you have to be willing to offer some concessions of your own. So that was part of the, the process of China being accepted as a member of the WTO. We'd also want to recognize that uh, countries that might have felt most skeptical about this, the very last country to agree to China joining the WTO turned out to be Mexico, because maybe the Mexicans perceived more of an immediate threat than the United States or Europe. But we probably didn't have a perfect foresight in those negotiations because when you think about what happens along the way, probably our negotiators didn't imagine that China was going to grow at over 10% a year, that their income was going to double every seven years, and their capabilities were going to expand very, very quickly. So we may have been a little uh, blasé about uh, what sort of Chinese challenge may there be in the future, and uh, even though there was sort of a phase-in period where we said, well, that is a very big country, we can't ignore if they make a priority of a certain product, they could flood the world with that particular product. So there was a, an initial mechanism to say, if there are surges of imports from China, we can clamp down on those and limit how many of those actually come in. But we're now past that initial phase-in period, but probably the question still arises so that we may still be a little bit worried about what is going to happen in terms of big surges of products from China. It'll just be different products than we might have predicted 15 years ago. So if we were looking at how has this trade pattern unfolded, we could uh, look at this sort of a graph. This may be the sort of chart that President Trump looks at because you don't really need to look at these uh, numbers too carefully. We're just uh, picking this up, if I got the, my little clicker working right. Yeah, so this starts at 2010 and goes out to 2016. 
this little, uh, the only thing that's really worth paying attention to is the little black column, that's U.S. exports to China. And this big magenta column is our imports from China. So you can see these don't look equal. And it doesn't look like it's getting any uh, closer together over that time period. So if we thought, uh, have we got a good reciprocal deal here? If they get access to our market, we get access to their market. We can see why President Trump all of a sudden is on his high horse on this particular topic. Now we want to be a little bit careful because of the way these statistics are compiled. So one of the things that we want to recognize is that a lot of what we import from China is the result of processing trade, where if you import a, an iPhone from China, it'll probably say something on the back, uh, designed in California, made in China, or something like that. But even if it says made in China, or import is from China, a lot of the value of that iPhone is coming from components that they bought from somebody else. So a lot of the value of that iPhone that shows up on imports from China is actually accounted for by parts that they bought from Korea or Japan or Singapore or other suppliers who made some of those elements that are in there. So that would be one thing we need to scale these down a little bit so it's not quite so extreme. The other is that uh, we know that uh, Hong Kong, it's still sort of a separate area from China. How separate seems to be a, a matter of major concern right now. But we run a $30 billion trade surplus with China, and a lot of those goods end up going into the mainland anyway. So this may not look quite so bad if we add in that surplus with Hong Kong. But we'd still, even if we made those sort of adjustments, this imbalance would be over $100 billion a year, bigger than our deficit with any other country. So we can see why there might be concern then about where we stand with trade with China. If we were to push ahead on that and look, well, what sort of a trade does China rely upon, do they rely upon that really as the engine that drives their economy? That they need to find those customers somewhere. And if they don't have them in China, because Chinese can't afford to buy the stuff, then are they going to look for customers somewhere else? That Sort of similar to a, a view that uh, was prevalent back in the 16th and 17th century, at the height of the Spanish Empire. and. We had a word for it back then, those people were called mercantilists. Exports were good, imports were bad. And back then, when you had a trade surplus, we were on the gold standard, so you earned a lot of extra gold if you sold all this extra stuff, and you could use that gold to hire mercenaries to extend the empire a little further. So maybe that was the rationale for saying you wanted to export a lot more than you could import we'd be looking to see are there neo-mercantilists out today, people who seem to accept that same view of the world, that it's great to export but not so good to import. And it, if we looked at that calculation, we want to know not just what does China trade with the U.S., we want to know what do they trade with everybody else, what do we find in terms of their pattern of trade. So a way that uh, the United States and most economists try to keep track of that story is to say, let's look at your exports minus imports and divide it by the size of your economy, by your GDP, your gross domestic product. So this is more or less saying, what share of your economy is accounted for by being able to sell to foreigners? Is that going to be a big driver of your economy? So if we look way back here, so this uh, starts at the, at the early 90s, and we can see there was a financial crisis in China back in 93. They came up with a, a whole new way of reorganizing their economy back then. But then we've got this period where there was sort of a stable amount of export surplus. But then we see this enormous peak right here, about 2004, 2005, 2006, where it's up about 9% of their economy. Really a significant element of saying, where are the customers for your products? Well, they're not in China, they're somewhere else. And if we wondered, well, 
Who was it they were selling to? Somebody else must have had a deficit at that time period. We could uh, think back and say, it was us. <laughs> it was the America that was accounting for a big part of that because we had a big deficit of about 5% of our GDP. And you may wonder, well, what was going on then? That was when we had a, a major housing boom in the United States. So a lot of our resources and inputs and labor were going into building houses. And where did we get the goods that we bought to put in those houses? We got the goods from China instead. So we've got this uh, sort of period that uh, we might say, that doesn't look sustainable. How could they keep doing that forever? And the same was true on the flip side. How could that be sustainable for the United States? How could we keep doing that forever, borrowing 5% of our GDP every single year from somebody else? So we can see that that was sort of the, the peak that we hit up there, and then we had the, the subprime mortgage financial crisis in the United States, and all those houses didn't turn out to be such a great thing to have acquired and China didn't have a market for, since we weren't building all those things at quite the same rate. And so now we're back down to a, a smaller sort of surplus for China of about 2.5% of GDP, which is uh, maybe, it looks better than this one at the peak, but that's still a, uh, a major amount of earning a lot more from what you sell to foreigners than what you spend on foreign goods. Back in the 1950s and 60s, when the United States was the big lender to the rest of the world, that was a surplus of about 1%. And that allowed us to acquire a lot of assets abroad. So when we look at that story, we'd say China is still acquiring a lot of assets abroad. If we wondered something about the, what they're acquiring, we could say they earned all this money for selling goods to us, they didn't spend it on importing goods. So what did those exporters do when they brought back all these dollars to China? And they don't pay their workers in dollars, so they had to take the dollars to the Central Bank of China, sort of their Federal Reserve, the People's Bank of China. So they took all those dollars to the Central Bank and they changed them to get renminbi instead so they could pay their workers. And that meant that the People's Bank of China ended up with a lot of dollars. And the People's Bank of China basically bought a lot of U.S. Treasury bills. When we observe that sort of transaction, that's the sort of story that uh, President Trump often tweeted, uh, particularly during the campaign, but even since then, he said, it looks to me like that's somebody who's a currency manipulator. They are simply buying dollars to keep the dollar high, and not letting their currency drop in value, which would make our goods more competitive in China. So what would we say about uh, the case for labeling somebody a currency manipulator? So this graph uh, doesn't show all those different years because the graph was gonna get a little boring if I showed you that. If we looked at this part up here, we can see that is just a flat line. And that was when China was keeping their currency pegged to the U.S. dollar. So this graph is showing us number of yuan per U.S. dollar. So when, uh, when we see the curve going down, that says the yuan is getting stronger. Chinese currency is rising in value. When we see uh, the line going up, that's saying the dollar is getting stronger. Their currency is getting weaker. So what, what do we want to get out of this diagram here? We want to recognize that over this early period, that if I had, had that chart go all the way back to 1996, all the way up through 2004, that just would have been a straight line the whole way because they kept the currency fixed that whole time. Well, we might recognize the United States said, that's great. Go ahead and do this. When it was 1997 and 1998, there was a big uh, financial crisis in Asia. We were worried about a, a downward spiral of every, everybody's currencies in Asia, as the Thais and the Indonesians and the Koreans. And several countries started competing with these drops in their currency, and was China going to join in the game and let their currency drop? So we were quite pleased when they did not let the currency drop in value. They kept it steady. And that meant that China wasn't trying to 
eat into the potential for Indonesia or, or Thailand or Korea to start selling more again. However, times change and conditions change and we might begin to wonder what was happening over this period here and we can observe that was the period where the United States uh, started running a really big deficit and China started acquiring lots and lots of dollars. So even though they said we will let the yuan rise in value over this period, it wasn't a case where uh, that solved all our problems and it wasn't a case where that said that they would continue to accumulate more dollars. So if we went all the way over to 2014, that was sort of the peak acquisition of dollars by the Chinese Central Bank, and they had accumulated $4 trillion. So it, when you put all those zeros on, it's hard to keep that straight usually, but $4 trillion is a lot of money. I'm not sure how much, but if we say our economy is about uh, $18 trillion, then uh, they're accumulating uh, something of about a quarter of the value of our GDP. So that gives, our question would be, well, what would you do with $4 trillion? And what did the People's Bank of China do with $4 trillion? Our answer would be that uh, they did buy a lot of U.S. Treasury bills. Now, I'm not sure, if, I know most of uh, us retirees here look at what sort of interest rate have you been getting on your savings account for U.S. Treasury bills, and uh, it's been sort of discouraging that maybe you get, uh, maybe it's edged up to 1% now, but uh, what's inflation at the same time? It's more than 1%. That says you are worse off at the end of the year than you were at the start of the year, that you have received a negative real rate of return in economic lingo. So, we'd say, well, that, that's bad news for you and me when we say, how does our retirement income stretch? But on top of that, what about China? If you were holding $4 trillion of something that's dropping in terms of its purchasing power, you might say, those guys wouldn't last very long managing my portfolio if all they can do is deliver losses year after year. But uh, maybe the whole question is, is that the thing China's keeping their eye on? Are they much more focused on another goal, and potentially the goal of saying, we want domestic stability. We want to make sure we've got jobs for people moving from the countryside into the city, and as a result, we, whether we lose a little bit of money here on our holding of these $4 trillion, that really doesn't bother us so much as saying, have we continued to provide jobs for people who will not end up choosing to riot and protest against the government. So I think just a, a difference in perspective of what, what are we keeping our eye on when we think about whether uh, this was a desirable policy or not. At any rate, uh, our goal, if we were going to label China as a currency manipulator, this probably would have been the period to do it, right in here, where they were accumulating those dollars very, very quickly. If we look at this last period over on the edge, where it looks like the renminbi is rising in value, or falling in value, so it's falling in value, the dollar is rising in value, so I don't want you to get confused like me up here as to what that <laughs> slope of the line means. So their currency is falling in value, what have they been doing to try to keep that from happening? And they have essentially sold off a trillion dollars worth of their dollar holdings to try to support the currency and keep it from falling quite that fast. So they'd say, we had four trillion, now we've only got three trillion because we just spent a trillion defending our own currency. So they, that looks a little tougher to accuse them of being currency manipulators when they just spent a trillion dollars trying to keep their currency from falling any faster. So we'll, uh, we'll say the, the jury is out on that one. If somebody were going to bring the case, it should have been President Bush back in this, whoops, back in that earlier period. But uh, we're going to move on to a, what I regard as probably the more germane topic to thinking about what President Trump might tweet on. So he might not be tweeting about 
about questions of whether we uh, are a currency manipulator or not. He doesn't seem to be on that hobby horse right now, but this provides a lot of grist for saying what sort of complaints do countries have about the policies of other countries. So the United States compiles this every year where they say what sort of problems have we encountered when we try and sell in foreign markets. So the U.S. Trade Representative, that's an executive office of the President, so that his staff would be compiling this list of trade barriers and uh, they organize it by country. So you could look and see, well, what's the, the sheet that we would throw at the Chinese and say, we've got qualms about all these particular things that you are doing right now. One of the first ones would be the question of Chinese industrial policy. So they have a five-year plan that says, here's what we hope to do over the next five years. And uh, we have some pretty ambitious goals in certain areas. They've said by 2025, we want to be the number one semiconductor producer in the world. We're going to devote $100 billion to that goal. So we know automatically that that looks like the sort of uh, a goal that potentially conflicts with a lot of other countries, especially the United States. Because if we look at these strategic industries that they are going to go ahead and promote, a lot of those look sort of familiar as to things we think are important in the U.S. and things that we are hoping to promote in the U.S. That we would say, we're looking at energy saving sort of stories and environmental protection. We haven't been as uh, ambitious as the Chinese on that front. I mean, the Chinese have said by 2030, we are going to phase out internal combustion engines. We are not going to have any more gasoline or diesel powered vehicles. We're going to have them all electric power. So if you set that as your goal and you're where you are in the commanding heights and can say where resources need to move, that uh, says they are probably going to make some pretty fast progress. And other countries are going to have to be uh, particularly attentive to that competitive challenge of China with a goal like that. We can see several of those other ones that are going to be flashpoints for a potential conflict in the future. If anybody was uh, watching the news in early August, uh, President Trump said he had asked his special trade representative, somebody named Robert Lighthizer, to go ahead and examine what Chinese policies in these areas actually were and if it was uh, justified to open a Section 301 investigation. So what in the world does that mean? That just is a part of the trade bill that was passed many, many years ago that says the United States gives itself authority to investigate and take action if it thinks our trade partners, partners are doing something unfair. Sort of we can be the judge and jury of what's going on here. This was a pretty popular policy back in the Reagan administration in the 1980s, but it was a different sort of world then because what the United States was complaining about was the lack of an effective international tribunal to make decisions and to solve disputes among countries. So we had something before the WTO was formed that was called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, but uh, that was a very uh, weak agreement that it had a rule that said if we bring a dispute to the, that organization and we, our experts find that you have violated your commitments to the GATT, that uh, you need to change your policy, in order for anything to follow from that, the ruling had to be adopted unanimously. So that would be saying essentially that somebody who was accused of acting unfairly could simply say, well, I don't accept that ruling. I'm not going to change my policy at all. So uh, the Reagan administration picked out four or five of these more egregious cases. I think the European Union had had a ruling against them that said they were keeping United States fruit cocktail out of Europe. And, uh, they didn't want to let that in to compete with fruit growers in the European Union. Now, why that was such a strong political voice in Europe, I don't know. But it gave a great sort of example for the Reagan administration to go after to say, 
look, you're not even willing to change your policy to come into conformity with what international, what you had promised would be access to your market, and you're blocking access to your market. So, as a result of that, the United States, under this 301 provision, said, we are going to retaliate against you. Countries obviously did not like this U.S. unilateral approach. And when the World Trade Organization was formed in 1995, they came up with another dispute resolution system that had a lot more teeth in it. Now, if you don't agree with a ruling from the WTO, you have to get unanimous consent to overturn that ruling instead of the opposite, where you had to get unanimous consent to adopt the, or, the, the ruling. So essentially, that said that one of those key motivations for the 301 cases back in the 1980s has sort of disappeared because we do have a, a much better dispute resolution mechanism under the WTO. That a lot of people get worried, has the United States given up its sovereignty if it's a member of the WTO? And President Trump has said, I think I may ignore some of those WTO rulings. We ought, to ignore, we ought to recognize that it's not that they can tell you, here's what you have to do. They can say, we think that your current practice is not consistent with your obligations to the WTO. But you've got an option. You can either change your policy, so that's what they hope is going to happen. But you could say, this is so important to me politically, that particular constituency I'm protecting, that I'm not going to change that policy, but I'll, act, I'll give you compensation by changing something else that's important to you. So you could take that tact. Or you could say, I'm not going to change anything and I'm not going to offer anything to you. In that case, the WTO authorizes retaliation by the injured party. So when we had a, a ruling against the United States in terms of our cotton subsidy program, the WTO authorized Brazil to retaliate. And when Brazil was thinking, well, what would really get the United States' attention here that would tell them that uh, you'd better wake up and do something, they said, we're going to retaliate by not recognize pharmaceutical patents in Brazil. <laughs> they did get our attention. <laughs> but we did, not, we did not change our policy. All we did was say, okay, Brazil, we will pay you some money to help your cotton farmers. But we still are very generous with our own cotton farmers. And uh, looking at what way the new uh, trade policies are evolving in, under the new farm bill, it's. Uh, it's not clear that we're ever going to take on the cotton producers of the South. At any rate, that, that's 301. We've got another set of industries that are of major concern, and that's industries where there's a lot of excess capacity. The Chinese, during those years of very rapid growth, they built up tremendous capacity in steel and aluminum. And now that they're not growing that fast anymore, they are essentially got all those big plants that they don't want to shut them all down at once and throw a lot of people out of work, so they're still producing, even though they're clearly not making money doing that. They're not covering all the fixed cost of that machinery and equipment that went into the steel mills to start with. So uh, the, the WTO does have some remedies we can turn to that are called unfair trade remedies. We can accuse the Chinese of dumping products in the United States by selling at a price that's below the full cost of production. And if it hurts a U.S. industry, then uh, we can impose anti-dumping duties. This is something that does not go to the president. This is decided in the United States just by the Department of Commerce saying did dumping take place, and by the U.S. International Trade Commission in saying did it hurt a domestic industry. So. In many cases, this is the preferred route to get protection if you're in the U.S. economy because it doesn't raise a, a big political flag. It's not where we don't have anybody paying attention to the interests of consumers or users of steel. So you don't have Caterpillar or Ford saying, if you raise the price of steel, we're going to be much less competitive on world markets. That doesn't enter into this decision at all. And you don't have any diplomatic considerations of saying, is that a 
Is that a friend or a foe? I mean, basically, uh, President Trump has labeled almost everybody as a foe, and I'm not sure if we've got any friends out there. But uh, this would be the question of what could we do in those cases? And we are filing a lot of, we're seeing the U.S. steel industry filing a lot of anti-dumping cases against steel producers throughout the world, but especially Chinese steel producers. So that's a, a fact that is moving along at a, a very rapid rate. The current Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross, is a steel man himself, so he is going to be promoting that as well. Okay, one uh, final thing we should know about trade with China is agriculture. They're our number one market for agricultural goods, and our question would be, well, if they're important to us as a market for agricultural goods, how, does, how much are they cooperating with us? And if we've got Governor Bradstad over there now, is he going to be able to get some more cooperation? Because unfortunately, we don't seem to be too long on that front right now. If we look at the, the first item up there, what about Iowa corn? How much Iowa corn do we sell to China right now? Back in uh, 2012, we sold over a billion dollars of corn from the United States to China. But since then, uh, our sales are about almost none. That they detected some uh, GMO varieties in some of those shipments that had not been approved in China, and they simply sent the shipments back. They also were aiming for self-sufficiency in corn production. So they have set a support price or target price in China that's about double the world price level, and their farmers responded, and they've produced a big mountain or surplus of corn in China. So they're not likely to buy too much corn from us regardless. That's related to the second one of those. That's uh, distillers dry grains. That's uh, side product from ethanol production. They put a, they can play the anti-dumping game as well as we can, so they put anti-dumping duties on our distillers dried grains coming into China, so those sales are way down. And uh, they put a tariff on ethanol coming from the United States into China. So we had a, a big ethanol tariff on Brazilian ethanol for many years, and maybe the Chinese looked at our model and said, well, if we want to build an ethanol industry, we'll put a big tariff on too. And uh, you may have heard on the news today that uh, there was a major commitment by Taiwan to, to buy a lot of these dry, dry distiller grains from the United States, and that's not quite a replacement for China's market, though, because Taiwan's not nearly the size of China. We know that uh, China bans the export of U.S. poultry because we had an avian flu outbreak a couple of years ago that devastated turkeys in Iowa and Minnesota. We've also had the Chinese had blocked sales of beef due to the mad cow disease back in 2003. That is one area that uh, we have seen progress in negotiations. That was a negotiation in June between the United States and China, one of these bilateral deals that, that President Trump likes. And uh, they did agree to let U.S. beef into China again. So that's certainly a plus that you can make progress on an issue like that. But of course, if they give us something we want, we have to give them something they want. So what we gave them was to say they could send cooked chicken in to the United States market. So whether you're going to buy your cooked chicken from China or whether you have confidence in health standards in China, the U.S. negotiating team said we've got inspectors over there to verify what the conditions these are being produced under. But uh, a tricky negotiation one that we'd certainly wonder, well, how easily do you uh, verify these things? They could, China could commit to this amount of sales, but are they actually going to occur? It takes a lot of patience if you're going to monitor the success of trade agreements. You can't have a short attention span because you've got to keep monitoring what happens year after year after year. And uh, let's uh, hope that our current administration has a long enough attention span to to see, are these agreements really fulfilled here? I think that's the key question that's going to help, help us think about this issue. Okay, so we finished one country, and you may wonder, how are we ever going to talk about all the other ones here today? I assure you I won't be so long-winded on the other ones, but uh, 
we probably ought to understand China most carefully because I think there are the most flashpoints on potential trade with China, that that's going to be probably for the next 10 to 20 to 30 years, we're going to be reading about these sorts of cases. Regardless of whether it, who's the president, we're going to have disputes with China. So we'll come back after our little break and we'll look at our other trading partners. Um, and we look forward now to getting back to Professor Moody. Jack. Okay, we, uh, our second most important trade partner is Canada, so we ought to have some sense of what's on the table when we look at trade with our partner. Their Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, is a young, charismatic, uh, leader of, of their country. We've got the Canadian currency, uh, the $1 coin, the loon, the $2 coin, often known, known as the loony and the toony. <laughs> <laughs> and when, way back in 2002, when, uh, when the Canadian dollar was uh, falling in value, uh, People often said, is this a bad Looney Tunes cartoon here with the <laughs> Canadian dollar falling so quickly? In terms of trade with Canada, we should recognize we had a trade agreement that we signed back in 1988 with Canada for the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement. This predates NAFTA. I bet nobody here wrote their congressman about that agreement. <laughs> But we should be aware that was highly controversial in Canada. That within Canada, people said, we do not want to become the 51st state of the United States. We ought to vote against this thing. We don't want to be hewers of wood and drawers of water, just sending natural resources down south of the border and all the manufacturing would go into the United States and it would all be lost in Canada. So those were the real fears at the time that uh, Prime Minister Brian Mulroney called an election, recognizing this was an important issue, and uh, two parties campaigned against it, against Mulroney being in favor of it, and the two parties split the no vote, and Mulroney won with a plurality, and went ahead and implemented the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement. So if you think, well, how can a president who doesn't have the majority vote have such confidence in his policies, happens all the time all over the world. It happened right here in Canada in terms of their moving ahead and saying we're going to sign this agreement because we're the party in power right now. If we looked at trade with Canada, sort of comparable to that picture we had with China before, we might say, wow, this must be President Trump's dream because it looks like they're just about equal in terms of what goes south, what goes north, We've got fairly balanced trade between the two. Now, this uh, actually is U.S. trade in goods and services. When President Trump talks about this, he usually talks just about trade in goods. It says services don't count, even though that's an important part of the economy as well. But when we add those two together, we can see we've got this uh, fairly balanced story taking place. So with uh, that sort of reciprocity, we might wonder, well, what happens with respect to Canada's trade generally? Are they balanced with everybody in the world, or is this something a, a little bit uh, unusual that they're balanced with the U.S.? So that other graph that we had for China, looking at what were exports minus imports divided by gross domestic product, looking at just how important is trade to their economy, we can see that uh, Canada sort of bounced all over the board here that we have some periods where the surplus in Canada was about five and a half percent. But then more recently, we can see Canada has been running a deficit, sort of like us. So now, what's changed in Canada all of a sudden? It looks like uh, when we're in this more modern era here, it's basically saying investment in Canada, people wanting to carry out new projects in Canada have been going up. Canadian saving has been going down, and uh, as a result, they've ended up with reliance on foreigners to finance those new projects that they're going ahead and building. So uh, 
little bit different picture than uh, what the U.S. picture is, where we've run a current account surplus ever since 1991. But for Canada, they had some fairly recent periods of a big surplus and now shifted over to a, a different position of deficit. So is Canada a candidate to be called a currency manipulator? Because we can certainly see there's a lot of volatility there. So this is how many Canadian dollars per U.S. dollar. So here's the Canadian dollars getting weaker over this period. That was when the U.S. had the dot-com boom and people wanted to put a lot of money into the U.S. So it bid up the value of the dollar over this era. We can see that the, here was about the era where the Canadians were worried about the Looney Tunes story of is it actually going to be that the Canadian dollar falls to just... Uh, 50 cents U.S. for one Canadian dollar. But then we can see there's a per tremendous period of growing strength of the Canadian dollar, and we can see the Canadian dollar was actually worth more than the U.S. dollar at this time period. So if you have been acquiring all those Canadian quarters and other things that you got uh, in change where somebody thought they were giving you a, uh, pulling a fast deal on you and giving you something worth less, we ought to recognize in some of those years that it's actually been a, a case where the Canadian currency is worth more than our currency. But we can see it's very volatile. So most recently, we can see there's been a big drop in the value of the Canadian dollar, which isn't so much a sign of currency manipulation because the Bank of Canada, their central bank, hardly intervenes in the exchange market at all. They're not piling up trillions of U.S. dollars. They are saying, we'll pretty much let the Canadian dollar find whatever its equilibrium level is. And so we wouldn't be on firm grounds uh, accusing them of currency manipulation. Instead, it would be a case of saying that what Canada exports is often tied to what's happening in natural resource markets. So if oil prices are really dropping, or other prices of nickel are going down, or zinc are going down, or all these sorts of natural resource exports, we would find that the Canadian dollar would probably be dropping too. So that's explaining a lot of this story here. If you said, uh, I want to bet on what's going to happen in natural resource markets, but I don't want to buy one of the big mining companies out of Brazil because that's too politically risky to me, Another good way to play your hunch of saying, I want to play the resource markets, is to buy the Canadian dollar, because it's going to move up and down a lot with natural resource prices. So with that sort of balanced trade we've had, and with the sort of story that uh, we don't really think the Canadians are out to manipulate their currency and gain an unfair advantage on us, you might think that President Trump wouldn't find much to tweet about, but in fact he has complained about Canadian policy on a couple of fronts. And so one of those fronts is dairy industry, and one of them is the lumber industry. Now the lumber industry is a long-standing dispute that uh, when I worked in Washington back in the 1980s, this was just getting off the ground and uh, no president since then has come up with an acceptable solution to that problem. So uh, we shouldn't say President Trump isn't doing his job if he can't negotiate a deal here because no one else has been able to negotiate a deal that stays stuck together. I think that the main reason that lumber, again, is on the front pages is because of this tremendous fall in the value of the Canadian dollar. So it makes Canadian lumber a lot more economical to buy in the United States compared to lumber that's produced in the U.S. If the Canadian dollar were to recover, I don't think we'd have a dispute going on right now. But uh, given the, the big drop that the Canadian dollar took, then that leads us to, to wonder how long we'll have that as a front page item. Okay, so our other item is the dairy industry. When President Trump was making sort of one of his campaign stops in Wisconsin recently, he indicated that uh, he was out to defend the interests of Wisconsin dairy farmers. And uh, I put butter up there, and I, fortunately, Gene Wubbles is going to get us straightened out on what sort of fats are good fats and what sort of fats are bad fats. <laughs> Just to take a survey, how many people have 
started eating less margarine and more butter. Yes. Oh boy. <laughs> okay, well, if you are part of an international trade dispute, <laughs> because what that has done is it says a lot of the milk produced in the United States now gets sent to the creamery to skim off the cream to make the butter. So what does that leave behind? That leaves behind a product called ultra-filtered milk. And what do they do with that milk? They may use it in making cheese, or uh, sometimes people use it to feed the pigs, or whatever they might do with it. The question is, what about that ultra-filtered milk? That's essentially what has caused this second uh, contentious controversy with Canada because the United States was sending a lot of this ultra-filtered -filter, milk across the border into Canada because Canada has a very different agricultural market for their dairy sector. Now, our dairy sector is uh, a little convoluted with a lot of special market orders on where you can sell the milk and what the price basing point has to be. And ours, uh, I would hate to defend it on logical economic grounds, but the Canadian system <laughs> is probably even more out of whack because they basically have the goal of maintaining very high prices for producers in Canada and they maintain those very high prices by assigning quotas to their each of their producers so you're allowed to produce so much of this milk and sell it at this particular high price but uh, the only way that works is if you can control all the sources of supply and our problem would be what happens if all this uh, uncontrolled U.S. milk comes across the border and starts undercutting prices. Well, the ultra-filtered milk was not a commodity that even existed back when they negotiated the Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement in 1987 and 1988. So uh, it didn't show up as a separate line on was there a tariff on that product at all because it wasn't even a product that was being traded internationally. But instead, what happened was that we ended up with uh, Canada setting a, a target price for their producers within the country as to what ultra-filtered milk ought to sell for. And if they set a high enough target price, then the question was, well, what's the U.S. going to do that can provide this a lot more cheaply than what the Canadian target price was? What Canada ended up doing, saying was, our, cust our producers are getting killed on this, we are going to drop the target price. We're going to make our target price so it's competitive with the U.S. price. And that's what President Trump is complaining about, that they dropped their target price. Not that they put a tariff on, but that just made their producers more competitive by setting a lower target price. So how that gets resolved, we'll see if that's... Uh, that's one of the contentious issues that's part of the NAFTA renegotiations. So we're going to say a little more about that when I move on to Mexico, simply because uh, we've sort of, all three of us are in that situation together, wondering what are the flashpoints, what are the things that could make that deal fall apart, what are the things that could really work well with the renegotiation. So this is uh, Mexico. You may have heard the expression, uh, Poor Mexico, so far from God, so close to the United States. <laughs> this is uh, the president of Mexico, Enrique Peña Nieto, and uh, he's got some scandals at home that uh, seem, we seem to have uh, politicians with Teflon abilities to shake off scandals, but he's not been able to shake off his scandals very easily. He's probably got uh, popularity ratings in the one-digit level now. So, it does raise questions when you think about if we're going to renegotiate NAFTA, the leading contender to replace him, Mexico has presidential elections in 2018, is an individual who is uh, adamantly opposed to NAFTA, would pull Mexico out if they thought it would be a very easy step to take. And President Trump has essentially shown how easy this is. You just need to give your trade partner 60 days notice that I'm going to withdraw, and you can do it. So uh, exactly what the Mexicans end up doing is going to depend a lot on what happens with this next election that's coming in 2018. The Mexican peso, I, I put in a picture of the, the one Mexican president who actually has a holiday named after him. 
Mexican presidents don't seem to be held in high repute, but uh, this is a Benito Juarez, who uh, was president back from 1858 to 1872, the, the one indigenous president of their country, one who was known for honesty and integrity, one who was known for wanting a secular economy, that, a secular country that wasn't dominated by either the army or the church. So he's uh, revered by many different quarters within Mexico, something that we don't necessarily find being uh, generally applied to politicians in Mexico. So we've got uh, the, the Mexican situation of, of trade with the United States. If we, uh, I guess we should say when the NAFTA agreement was negotiated in the United States, we should probably give a little more uh, background on that compared to when the Canada-U.S. free trade agreement was negotiated, that uh, while it was very controversial in Canada when that earlier negotiation went on, this was the one that was very controversial in the United States. But uh, that was a period where, uh, let's see, I, I, I was going to at least give you what some of the numbers were on uh, when that NAFTA agreement finally passed. It was negotiated by George Henry Walker Bush, but uh, Democrats didn't want to move it through under a Bush presidency, so President Clinton said, I will renegotiate a couple of side agreements, and then it went before Congress, but it basically took a, a lot of Republican votes to get that through the House, that it was essentially the House voted 234 to 200 in favor of it, and 160 of those votes were Republican and 80 of them were Democrats. So, this was back when Democrats, or when Republicans believed in free trade, trade agreements. And that was how we got that agreement, very controversial in the United States, how that got on the books here. So what has happened as a result? I have been traced out all the prior years of trade from 1994 on. But we can see what's happened more recently, and this is again one of the pictures that President Trump would probably be looking at, because he's laid down one of his markers in the renegotiation of NAFTA. He's saying, I want to get rid of this inequality, that we're running a trade deficit with Mexico of about $56 billion, and I want something that will eliminate that deficit. So it doesn't look like it's nearly as out of whack as trade with China, but uh, it certainly is uh, a contrast to Canada. If we wanted to say, well, why has that arisen? Why have we ended up with that deficit? And again, as we said in the case of trade with China, we want to recognize what all is included in the value of a good that's sent across the border. Is that something that uh, includes inputs that have been received from other countries? So if Germany sends parts to their Volkswagen plant in, in Puebla, Mexico, and then those are exported up to the United States. Some of those Volkswagen cars then are going to represent trade with Mexico, but with a lot of German content. Or if it's TVs coming from Mexico, from Sun, part of those will be parts from Korea that then are exported by Mexico into the U.S. So some of that imbalance, again, is due to this uh, operation, we, we call them maquiladores, that, that operate along the border especially. But it also might make us wonder about uh, Ross Perot's predictions way back in when this controversial agreement was being negotiated and when we had a presidential election in 1992. Ross Perot ran as a third party candidate and got 19% of the vote. He uh, was against the agreement with Mexico and, and actually Donald Trump spoke out against the agreement in 1993. He's been against it for 25 years, so it's not something he's just picked up and saying this is a politically popular thing. He's consistently said he's against the agreement. And part of the, the perception, I think, was Ross Perot's prediction, would there be the sucking sound of all these jobs going across the border into Mexico? So you may remember that uh, line from the 1992 election. Well, it definitely did make a difference by having that agreement in place that uh, business people all of a sudden 
felt a lot more confidence investing in Mexico because Mexico had a long tradition of being both uh, very close to the outside world and very arbitrary in changing their policy very quickly. So the idea that you had a treaty commitment was regarded as something that made it much safer to put your investment into Mexico. And so U.S. multinationals obviously have gone there, but others from Germany and Korea or Japan have also located there, saying that's a good base to serve the North American market. So that undoubtedly is part of the story behind why does Mexico export so much stuff. If we thought about Mexico in, in general, about what is their trade pattern, so this is looking at their trade deficit as a share of GDP. And we can see for all these years here that they've consistently run a deficit with most everybody else. And that's really what we expect often is true for a developing country, that we say developing countries usually have many more attractive investment prospects, new things that could be made or infrastructure that could be built there, then they have the savings to finance themselves. So we think of that extra investment being financed by outsiders, by foreigners. And that says this is certainly going on in Mexico when we look at this uh, long period here. The, the period of Mexico having a, a surplus was sort of the, the result of their having a major financial crisis back in 1995. And how did they repay people who had lent them money? So you, they had to run a surplus to repay people. Once they had reestablished trust in their ability to repay, then they could continue borrowing again. But this was a, sort of a lump in the, the process of how did NAFTA play out for these countries. If we looked at uh, the Mexican currency, we'd see that the Mexican currency, this is pesos per dollar. So it looks like the Mexican currency has got steadily lower through this whole period here. So why does the Mexican peso fall in value? Is it a big plot by the Mexican government? And again, we want to say, no, it doesn't seem to be that their central bank is buying lots and lots of dollars. They hold maybe four months worth of imports worth of dollars so that if all of a sudden there was a shock to the system, they could still afford to import some stuff. But the, the big question would then be, why has the currency continued to fall? And it would be because of inflation in Mexico. Mexico simply has a higher inflation rate than we do in the US. And to keep from being priced out of the market, their currency has to fall in value. So it's not particularly a major plot on the part of the Mexicans. It's saying that we expect the peso to decline to offset the fact that they have more inflation. If we look at this very recent period, we can see there's a real big spike, but that means the, do the dollar really jumped, the peso really fell. So uh, about the time that started, that was November when the election results came out, and this was inauguration day in January. So within a couple of months, uh, we had the peso fall in value by 17%. Fortunately for Mexico, that's reversed since then, that it's come back down. But we can see that it, simply the perceptions of was President Trump going to go after the Mexicans had a really drastic effect on the value of the peso. And usually politicians don't like to see these tremendous variations because a weak peso means the cost of living in Mexico is going up. Anything you want to buy from outside of Mexico gets a lot more expensive. So uh, that would not be a, a popular situation for for a Mexican politician to be coming into an election with a rising cost of living in the country. So what sort of particular items are there? There was an early negotiation between the United States and Mexico over a sugar agreement. And uh, the only reason I mention this for an Iowa audience is because what happens in sugar has something to do with Iowa. If we have a dispute with the Mexicans over whether we accept their sugar, then uh, their threat point is to say, well, if you won't take our sugar, we won't take your corn syrup. And so uh, this was the agreement that was hammered out in June between the Trump administration and Mexico, saying we're, 
We don't like all this sugar coming in. We're still going to let the same amount come in, but not as much of it can be refined. More of it has to just be raw sugar to help our refiners in the United States. But in, in many respects, people thought that was uh, maybe a, a less drastic sort of uh, outcome than they had been worried about. They, they were worried that our chief negotiator in that strategy lives in Florida and his next door neighbor is a big sugar baron in the United States. So they were afraid, was he going to take the sugar industry line and uh, essentially say, uh, we're going to be very dogmatic on how much Mexican sugar comes in, and would we trigger the Mexican response to say, we're going to keep corn syrup out of Mexico. Obviously, that's not uh, the whole story of trade with Mexico, though, because uh, we've got these broader issues of updating NAFTA. And what are some of the things that possibly could go right about those negotiations? And so uh, some of the conservative think tanks in Washington say, well, President Trump shouldn't worry about looking like he's inconsistent. He's done that before. What he should do is look at some of the areas where they made tremendous progress in the Trans-Pacific Partnership that was negotiated with countries in the Pacific Rim area, essentially. And that included Mexico and Canada, who were in on those negotiations. So there was already agreement on several new issues that didn't exist back when NAFTA was negotiated. So things like e-commerce, so things that uh, I should uh, look and make sure I don't uh, misstate what all those new, new things were. But uh, essentially, Yeah, so they, they had come to some agreement on how we ought to be protecting intellectual pop property and biological patents. They had come to agreements on how service trade ought to be regulated. They had come to agreements on how state-owned enterprises ought to be controlled. They had come to agreements on any further tariff changes that needed to be made. So that there obviously were a lot of things that Canada, the U.S., and Mexico already agreed on. But when President Trump withdrew us from those negotiations, that meant that those items are no longer ones that uh, we necessarily are going to move forward on. But yet, uh, the fact that they've already hammered out some language that's acceptable would be a, a, good sim a good omen for coming up with something for the future. In terms of extreme provisions that might lead to somebody walking away from the agreement, the things that seem to be uh, more or less uh, deal killers here. One would be to have a, a provision in there that said a country is, uh, can ignore whatever the bilateral dispute mechanism is. So Canada would definitely say that's the basis to reject this agreement. That was how they sold the agreement back in 1988 to say, there's got to be some sort of tribunal that holds America to account when they don't administer their own law appropriately. Somebody who looks over and says, did you really follow the procedure that your own law says you're supposed to follow? And since uh, we may well have made, taken shortcuts along the way, Canadians have found that a, a useful way to, to hold us accountable. If well, there were a provision in there that said there's always got to be balanced trade, Clearly, the, the Mexicans would agree to something or disagree with something like that, that would say that doesn't belong in a trade agreement. The, to say that every year or every five years or whatever the standard might be, does requiring balanced trade, is that what you want to mandate the outcome or do you want to mandate the conditions under which countries can compete? And traditionally, our approach has been to say, let's mandate the conditions under which they compete not mandate the outcome of here's what share of the market you ought to get and here's what share of the market I ought to get. So those would be uh, sort of deal killers. The, if there were something put in there about currency manipulation, probably Mexico and Canada wouldn't object too much, but they question why does that belong in a trade agreement? That uh, currency manipulation is really something that is more uh, relevant to a, an international finance arrangement through the International Monetary Fund or something else. 
Probably the, the other big controversial issue would be, what if America adopts more Buy America clauses? If you're going to remake the infrastructure of America, do you have to do it with only America Steel or only America Cement? Or would you put a, a waiver in to allow for Canadian or Mexican cement or steel? So if there were not such a waiver for for Mexico and Canada, I think they would regard that as working against the whole idea of NAFTA and a free trade, free movement of goods within the North American continent. And then finally, if they took on specific sectors of the economy, like Canadian dairy or Canadian lumber, and said, we don't like the way you run your system, you've got to change, we'd have to seriously ask, well, what are we willing to change? If we had things that the Canadians objected to, if they said, why should it be that if you have a ship carrying uh, goods from Seattle to Alaska, why should that only be an American ship? Couldn't that just as well be a Canadian ship? Why does that have to be American navigation only? So are we willing to put things like that on the table? And they would con conversely say, well, it would be pretty drastic for us to put things like the Canadian Dairy Program on the table. Okay, so those are things that we'll be looking for. That We've had two of these negotiating sessions so far on NAFTA. We know they're under a, sort of the gun to try to conclude this before we get into the Mexican presidential election and potentially a, a new Mexican president. So whether they can come to agreement on some real complicated stuff in about six months' time, that's... Uh, that's going to be quite a challenge. Okay, our next partner we're going to look at is Germany. And uh, we've got Angela Merkel up there as the Chancellor of Germany. If you, uh, if you were to look at uh, my name, M-U-T-T-I, is also uh, Muti in German. If you Google Muti, you probably get more hits on Angela Merkel because she's known as Muti. She's been uh, the mother of the German state who's making sure that things run smoothly. She's been elected for three terms. We've got a new election coming up in Germany that probably is going to be elected to a fourth term as chancellor. So uh, that means that we've got uh, somebody else to, to be paying attention to here. So we're going to do this uh, real quickly because I'm going to run us out of time. Should we be so worried about Germany? And our, and our question, and yeah, we do have this trade imbalance with Germany. They export a lot more to us than we import. We can see that it's not just a problem with the US, though, because this is their trade surplus as a share of GDP, and it's just going up and up and up. And we wonder, well, who else are they selling to, since it's not just with the US? And the big problem is that it's uh, with European trade partners. So the, the main problem is that Germany produces a lot more than it spends, it saves a lot more than it invests, and uh, we may wonder, well, why do they save so much? And why don't they invest in Germany? Why do they invest all those extra savings abroad? And our answer would be, well, it's a population that's getting older, so they want to be prepared for, what are you going to do with all those old people that are not going to be producing things for you anymore. And we also know that just as in the United States where corporate profits are at an all-time high, they are an all-time high share of income in Germany, so more than income is being saved. And on top of that, the government saves. They don't run big deficits like our government. They instead balance their budget and they preach that to other European countries and uh, it says essentially they don't want to be the big locomotive for growth in Europe. They don't want to run a big deficit, create a lot of extra demand, and try and pull countries like Portugal and Ireland, <coughs> Greece and Italy out of recessions that they're in. So uh, it's more a question of uh, Germany wants to run a, a, sur a surplus or a balanced budget. The EU really needs it to run a deficit buy from those other European partners to lend a stability of the euro. So uh, 
we could think about specific things that we object to with, with Germany, but uh, I don't think we need to focus on that so much. We, I'm not going to take time to look at our story with Japan because uh, Japan's sort of like a, a similar story to a mix of Germany and China that they also seem to have been mercantilists in the past. China seems to be following the model of the Japanese, and uh, they also have a very rapidly aging population. So they are saving a lot to say, what do we do with all these people that are getting old and our population is dropping? So back in World War II, the idea was that 100 million hearts beat with the heart of the emperor, they're about going to be under 100 million if yet. So uh, Japan is definitely losing population and they're getting older fast. So that colors a lot of what their trade situation looks like. Okay, but I will quit now in case uh, leave a, a few tiny minutes for discussion. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, to let people get away and get to where your noontime meal is, I don't want to slow you down on that, but if you are fascinated by economics and want to come up and talk about it more, I'll be glad to talk with you too. <laughs> if people have questions, I'll be glad to. Do, does anybody have a question they'd like to ask? Judy? Um, what's the inflation rate for the United States? Our inflation rate, I think, uh, well, I should ask people, what did Social Security tell you our payments were going up by? It was, it was at 1.7 percent. So, so our inflation rate is fairly low, which uh, that's why we have a lower rate than Mexico, which does have a higher inflation rate of three to four percent. So that says unless the peso dropped in value, we would find Mexican goods being priced out of the U.S. market. Not much. Could, could you compare a little more uh, completely the economies of Germany and the U.S.? I mean, what is it that we're doing? <laughs> Why is it that they can satisfy demand and we never seem to have enough money to do everything that needs to be done. Well, I think they, uh, so the question was, what could I say about the German economy compared to the U.S. economy? Why does it seem that they have a capability to do a lot of things that we don't seem to be able to get around to do? So part of that would be a, a different uh, political and economic structure. The, idea of how much should we pay in taxes as a share of our income? Do we value the public services that are going to be provided? And so we pay a, a smaller share of our income in taxes than the Germans do. Uh, the Germans will complain about that. A lot of Germans would say, uh, I'm tired of paying this surcharge on my income tax in order to refinance uh, construction in the eastern zone, things that uh, have gone on for quite a while, but Germany's actually slowed down on that uh, reconstruction of the East, that the East seems to be uh, in better shape, at least in the big cities, than it has been in the past. So part of it's, uh, we get what we pay for, and so they pay more and they get more. We don't pay as much, we don't get as much. In terms of the structure of their economy, they have uh, more of a weighting toward making things we often think of fine German precision, and I don't know who owns German automobiles here, or what the allure of buying a, a BMW or an Audi or whatever else happens to be, but we usually think they're very well made, very well engineered, and that's been a strength of the German economy, and it, it's actually been a reason why they have been successful in selling into China, that they, uh, they import about as much from China in terms of their size of their economy as we do. But they export a lot more to China. So why have they been able to export to China so much more successfully than we have? And a lot of it's been that they produce the, these sorts of products that appeal to the, the Chinese to say, we value those well-engineered products too. Thank you.
So uh, they have a slightly different economic structure, which gives them a slightly different way of confronting whatever their problems are. We know that a big current problem is immigration. So how's Germany going to integrate all those immigrants coming in? So they probably are looking at the U.S. saying, how do you do that? Because we've got to figure that out for ourselves now. Push the baby. Oh, well, that youngest grandson. <laughs> <laughs> We want to thank you, Jack, for sharing with us and helping us to understand a little bit more than we did before. Um, before uh, you leave today, I want to just remind or tell you that if you want one of these lovely bright pink bucket stuffers, they're in a bucket on the table as you go out. So uh, before you leave, turn on your cell phones and turn off your T coils. And come back next week on the 27th, we will be listening to Caleb Elfenbein, Associate Professor of History and Religious Studies at the college. Caleb will be uh, talking to us about the U.S. in the Middle East, another good topic. So thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next week.